Gentlemen, this film which you are about to witness has two purposes. We first intend to give you the problem which confronts the motion picture theater today, and we want to present this in an effort to conserve your time. This is being made under the auspices of the Council of Motion Picture Organizations, which represents all of us in the motion picture business. The technicians who make the pictures, the shipping clerks and bookers, and the film exchanges who speed them to the theaters of the country, the cashiers, ushers, and doormen, managers, janitors in the theaters themselves, all of us are vitally interested in our situation today, and we earnestly solicit your attention. Like most businesses, the motion picture business consists of four elements. A manufacturer, which we call a studio, a distributor, which we call an exchange, a retailer, which we call a theater, or picture show, and a product which we call, strangely enough, product. The overwhelming investment in this industry and its real heart are the retailers, the theater. Hollywood gets the headlines, but the theater is the motion picture industry. Actually, the theater represents 93% of the vast investment in the movie industry. The studios only 7%. Consequently, the real threat imposed by the 20% tax is aimed right at the heart, the 93% of the movie industry, the retailer, the theater. Your local theater is an integral part of the business, civic, cultural, and religious life of the community. Friday date nights and Saturday kid matinees have been traditional American events. The theater also provides needed community facilities, an auditorium for school graduation and play, public meetings and religious ceremonies. The theater owner gives his screen freely to both national and local charity drives, the Red Cross, infantile paralysis, the community chest, to all worthy charities. In an era of plenty, while population has increased by 25 million and national income has tripled, this tragic sign has appeared in the past six years on approximately 4,500 theaters. Closed. Since 1946, Representative Reed, 294 theaters were closed in New York. In Ohio, Representative Jenkins, 239 theaters closed. In Pennsylvania, Representative Simpson and Ephra Harder, 228 closed. In New Jersey, Representative Kane, 112. In Nebraska, Representative Curtis, 55. In Illinois, Representatives Mason and O'Brien, 285. In Iowa, Representative Martin, 86. In Washington, Representative Holmes, 51. In Wisconsin, Representative Burns, 69. In Missouri, Representative Curtis, 111. In Tennessee, Representatives Cooper and Baker, 47. In Michigan, Representatives Dingell and Knox, 186. In Arkansas, Representative Mills, 79. In Kentucky, Representative Gregory, 73. In Georgia, Representative Camp, 68. In Rhode Island, Representative Ferrand, 17. In California, Representatives King and Ott, 272. In Massachusetts, Representative Goodwin, 137. In Louisiana, Representative Boggs, 63. In Connecticut, Representative Sadlack, 31. Closed. Big theaters, little theaters, old theaters, new theaters. Big city theaters, small town theaters. Closed. Approximately 4,500 theaters since 1946. One out of every four in the country. A dead loss to the nation and to the community, to the individual, and to the government. Today, at this frightening rate of decline, today, while you gentlemen are sitting here, 
two more theaters will disappear. Tomorrow, two more, and so on. Far into the economic darkness. Let us take a concrete look at this situation. Gentlemen, my name is Lehman Marshall, and I've been operating here for nearly 28 years. Last year, we paid the government and almost $18,000 in admission taxes. We had a net loss in our operation last year of over $12,000. Had we been able to have kept this tax, we would have made a net profit of a little under $5,000, which is a very small profit for about a $400,000 investment. We know that we cannot continue our operation as we have been going unless we do get this relief. Waldron, a widow in Lindsay, Oklahoma. I love my town. I've been here a long time. My husband and I were partners in this show business for 20 years before his death. Since his death last year, I've been able to pay the regular theater operating expenses, but in the face of the rising cost, that's all I've been able to pay. Now we have been a part of this community activity, or rather this community and its activities, all this time. Whenever the high school classes want to raise money, they came to the theater. The farmers had a meeting here last month. The Christian Church will hold services here this summer while it builds a new church. The Methodist Church has Sunday school classes for 15 years in, in the theater. But since my husband's death, I've had to take the life insurance money to pay the federal tax. By the end of this month, January 1953, that money will have been gone. I don't know what I'll do. Where do I go from there? My name is John Volokas. I'm a motion picture exhibitor in the town of Flat Rock, Michigan. Population approximately 2,000, serving as a rural center for 10,000 people. In 49, business was better than ever. For Uncle Sam, a 20% excise tax, I turned an amount over for the year 1949, $10,600. My salary for the same period, $7,800. As we skip a few years and come to 1951, tax collection had dropped down to $8,300 and my salary had to be adjusted to $1,660. In 1952, my business felt as if the bottom had dropped out. My salary for the entire year, working 12 months out of the year, amounted to $200. For Uncle Sam, his excise tax, I collected $6,100. As the only businessman in my community, I find that I must carry an unfair tax. The butcher, the baker, the department store doesn't have to turn 20% of their growth revenue over to Uncle Sam. Yes, I do. I have stated facts and figures. They may be verified at the Internal Revenue Department. Gentlemen, you heard my case. As a taxpayer, as a citizen, and as a veteran, please give me due consideration. Thank you. I am C.R. Guthrie, Secretary Treasurer of Video Independent Theaters. We operate approximately 175 theaters in the Southwest. There has been a general decline in our business since 1947. And just to give you an idea of the decline in the last two years, 1951 expenses 
exceeded box office admissions by $336,000. In 1952, expenses exceeded box office admissions by $376,000. We are extremely concerned about the future of our business unless this federal tax is repealed. men were very concerned as to whether they would rebuild or not. They felt that it hurt, was hurting their business tremendously and it has hurt our business. They feel that it is a very vital part of our community life and very necessary to have a theater here for the support of our trade area. I'm Todd Cooper, owner of Hope and Drug Company here in Houghton, Kansas. Since the Arcadia Theater was destroyed by fire, I've noticed about a 10% reduction in fountain business. The night business has been down considerably. And, and uh, young people have uh, more or less went to different towns where they do have theaters. My name is Gordon Bauer of the Bauer Furniture Store at Holton, Kansas. We have found that a theater is a big asset to the town. There's no question about it. If there wasn't any question in anybody's mind, all they would have to do would be to step out on the street about 9 o'clock on Saturday night. My name is E.R. Baum, owner of the Holton Supermarket in Holton, Kansas. Mama trades in a town where she can take the youngsters to the picture show and then do her trade. Uh, with the picture show gone, Mama doesn't come to town anymore. Uh, the business at night here uh, is practically gone completely. And on Saturday afternoon, it has gone down approximately 40 percent. In 1946, the theaters of the United States grossed approximately $1,500 million. In 1947, they grossed approximately $1,400 million. In 1948, $1,250 million. In 1949, $1,200 million. In 1950, 1150 million. In 1951, 1120 million. In 1952, 1075 million. In six years of unprecedented national prosperity, the annual movie gross has dropped more than 425 million dollars. And significantly, not a sudden drop, but slowly, surely, and tragically. Here are typical examples of what is happening to the nation's box offices today. These examples can be approximately duplicated in a thousand other situations. A large first-run metropolitan theater in the period from 1947 through 1952 showed a loss of $8,613.39 and paid federal admissions taxes of $155,619.16. This, of course, in addition to all other taxes. The suburban theater's books show these distressing figures for the same period. Loss, $806.74. Admissions taxes paid $38,504.44. A small town theater in 1951 paid in admissions taxes $26,259.13. Its profit, $130.59. The foregoing examples indicate that actually thousands of theaters have ceased to exist as private enterprises and are working solely for the government. What is the pattern of other industries? Here are records compiled from the Department of Commerce surveys of current business. Clothing, up. Up 37%. Food, up. Up 49%. Steel, up. Up 66%. Petroleum and coal, up. Up 
112%. Motion pictures, down. Down 29%. What one factor distinguishes the picture industry from the others? It is the only one of these industries, gentlemen, that has a 20% tax taken right off the top. We would here like to emphasize that the industry requests no preferred treatment. We expect to pay our taxes as other retailers pay them. This, we know, is the price of good government. So, like other retailers, we pay our taxes. We pay our corporation tax, social security tax, unemployment tax, raw film tax, supply tax, sales tax, real estate tax, personal property tax, occupation tax, license tax, assessment tax, school tax, road tax, sign tax, marquee tax, fire inspection tax, billboard tax, state excise tax, refreshment tax, income tax, if any. So as you see, we pay taxes. But above and beyond these taxes which we pay in common with other retailers, we also must pay a 20% admissions tax, which by itself represents approximately six times, six times the net profit of the United States theaters as a whole. Of course television hurts the picture business. There's no doubt about that. In Chicago, for example, city collector William T. Prendergast announced on February 2nd that more theaters went out of business in 1951 than in the preceding 25 years combined, and that the movie attendance slump has cost the city $1 million in the last three years in revenue for theater licenses. Our statistics show that when 20% of a community has TV, the box office is down 10%. Where 40% has TV, the box office is down 20%. And when the saturation point is reached at 80%, the box office is down 40%. TV is here to stay, and so are we. We can meet the tax-free TV competition, but only if we are allowed to compete on fair and equal terms. Only if we are allowed to function under normal economic law. We can eventually prosper, but only if we are allowed to fight with our full strength. Not 80% of it, but 100%. He is operating, gentlemen, on a shoestring. He wants to paint and redecorate his theater, but he has no reserve for depreciation. He wants to replace old and worn equipment, but he has no reserve for obsolescence. He wants to grow with his community, but he has no reserve for expansion. He wants to keep up with the modern department store, the attractive drugstore, the gleaming supermarkets, the fashionable shops none of which is strangulated by a comprehensive 20% tax. For seven years, he has watched his capital, his reserve, and his profits slowly disintegrate. But he looks forward today with the hope that, under fair economic treatment, he can and will reverse the downward trend. As a final point, let us look at this problem from the government's viewpoint, the Treasury's viewpoint, the hard dollars and cents viewpoint. Would the exemption of motion picture theaters from the 20% federal admissions tax mean a sweeping loss of revenue to the federal government? The answer is absolutely no. Here are the facts. It is estimated that in 1953, the maximum federal admissions movie tax collected will be approximately $200 million. If this tax reform were enforced in 1953 and the amount added to the theater's gross, the Treasury Department would recover by additional personal income taxes and additional corporate taxes approximately $120 million, or 60% of the amount it would collect by keeping the tax in effect. Further, the invigorating economic effect of releasing this money to the theaters to spend to revitalize their properties and promote their products could very well stimulate a 10% increase in movie attendance. On this basis, 
the Treasury could conceivably receive back an additional $45 million, or a total of $165 million, representing 82% of the maximum tax it would normally collect. It is entirely possible that with this tax reform, the Treasury Department could actually recover more revenue than it would relinquish. Closed theaters pay no taxes at all. This tax reform keeps them open. More revenue for Uncle Sam. Expanded capital investments and excess profits. Additional sources of revenue. More business for allied industries. More revenue for the Treasury. With this tax reform would come benefits both to the Treasury and to the theaters. For example, such depressing economic situations as this one, which is by no means rare, could be rectified. In 1948, which incidentally was not a peak year, one of the largest theater circuit corporations in the country paid in corporate taxes to the U.S. Treasury approximately $8,100,000. In 1949, it paid in corporate taxes approximately $6,500,000. In 1950, $3,800,000. In 1951, $2,400,000. In 1952, $650,000. These figures need no comment. All our figures, which are available for your inspection and consideration, indicate plainly that the 20% federal admissions tax on theaters is not only depleting the nation's box offices, but is actually contributing less and less each year to the nation's treasury. They indicate, gentlemen, the immediate need for tax reform for the nation's theaters. This, then, is our case. Gentlemen, we're practical businessmen. We've been in the show business a long time. And we feel confident that we can cope with these problems. But we do need your help. Because the situation is getting no better. We have seen the figures for January of 1953. There is no improvement. We do need your help, and quickly. Now, on behalf of all of us in the motion picture industry, I want to thank you for your gracious attention.